Hey tryhards, Ethan here. Before we get into the show today, I want to talk to you guys about Patreon. Patreon is a donation service, a monthly subscription service where you donate money to me to support the show, to support uh, the growth of it, whether that means merchandise or more podcasts or other things of that nature. And I would really appreciate if you guys will be willing and able to give just a little bit of whatever extra money you may have. Because while the show will always be free for everyone to listen, um, the way to make it isn't. And I'm in college, and things are expensive. So I'd appreciate any little amount that you're able to give. So thank you for donating, and thank you even more for listening. Hello, my name is Ethan Hewlin. Like you, I live in a world that never stops moving. Also like you, I have stories. These are my stories. The true stories of a tryhard. Welcome back to True Stories of a Tryhard. I am Ethan Hewlin, and this week I have yet another friend from the internet, Carter Dvorak. Carter, say hi. Hi. Hi, Ethan Hewlin. Hi, internet. Hi, tryhards. Are, are all the audience also tryhards, or are we just the tryhards? Everyone is a tryhard if they want to be. Feel that, for sure. All right, so uh, this week, listeners, Carter and I are going to be talking about something that's very personal to Carter, as I like to do with all of my guests. Uh, Carter, um, tell the, the listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi. So I am a junior in high school, and I am a person. That's just to get that out of the way. Um... In, when I was younger, when I was in like elementary school, and even still now, I deal with Tourette's syndrome on a like semi-consistent basis. I think it was developed around like first or second grade is when I really started to like see it. And basically, what Tourette's is is kind of this thing where like they're called tics, so they're kind of like involuntary movements. So like every once in a while, like you could just kind of like sit there, and like your hand has this like urge to like. In my case, it's a lot of like tensing or like kind of just like. Uh, it's hard to describe and articulate audio wise but just like to kind of to tense or to kind of bend or something like that and it just can like happen kind of whenever and i used to have one where like i had to like i would blink really hard where your eyes just like you have this like weird kind of compulsion to like blink really hard and then it wasn't fun and so that was kind of happening around like first or second grade is when it really started to kind of get noticeable and get bad and it was definitely a struggle with something that like took me out of things i think people like i'd had people come up to me like fellow second grade friends like why do you blink really hard and i'm like i don't know it just kind of is a thing and so kind of dealt with that for a while and i'm really thankful my mom and parents like really dove into it as to like okay what is this we found out we had tourette's and that i had this tourette syndrome and they're like okay how do you work on it right how can you fix it we found a study in university of wisconsin milwaukee And so we went to that study for a summer and I learned like habit reversal therapy, basically where like, so let's say if I have the urge to like blink really hard, instead of doing that, try to like take time and kind of like blink slowly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it helped to kind of like deal with that to kind of find these like alternatives, right? If I have to like bend my wrist back, if that's an urge, I like just kind of fold my arm. So it's like doing something that is less noticeable that kind of maybe not scratches that urge, but can kind of, like, be a way to negate it. And so that was really cool. And, like, I think even in that study, they said, like, I went from, like, basically 95% recovery rate, which was really incredible and really cool. And, like, I'm still super thankful and, like, happy, and I feel blessed from that experience of, like, and really thankful for my parents in that regard of, like, my mom, like, went to conferences and took the time to really, like, track these people down and to find out who they were and so that was just a really wonderful experience but that's kind of been my journey up to this point with that that's really cool and i'm, I'm glad you were able to to find that and you were able to uh to improve yourself um i don't know um i don't know if people have talked to you about this before but there um there are definitely some misconceptions about like how tourette's is expressed and I know it's a case-by-case basis for a lot of people, but, like, 
what are some things that you've seen that are definitely like not characteristic at least in your case i mean in my case there are like you said like there's different forms of it there's different case-by-case things some of them are very verbal some people have like basically this compulsion to swear and it's really like kind of strange to see but it's just kind of how they are and so i think you see like a lot of different ways mostly when i experience it i don't know many people who either have it or know of it and like it doesn't come up much but i think it definitely maybe be seen as like symptoms of other things or maybe even like intuitive of i don't know somebody's like i don't want to say mental state but like intuitive of like oh this guy's kind of like making a weird yelping noise maybe he's something right and so more so they're like what you find is like these people are pretty normal for the most part like to the extent of what is normal but like these people are pretty you know fine mentally it's just this issue of like every once in a while you're just gonna just swear with no prompting with no context and or every once in a while you just kind of like kind of move your arm or jump a little bit and i think really i guess the big takeaway that i've seen is like it doesn't really i think affect one's mental state that much and so i think that's something to look at too of i could see somebody like from a viewer who just has no idea looking at that and thinking like oh they're obviously they have something wrong in the head they always say have something deeper than that when really we're pretty normal people just with these weird you know not even weird like trying to find better terminology like we're pretty normal people but just with this thing right this thing that we have to deal with right i mean i think everybody has a thing it's just that with tourette's it's a lot more forceful and a lot more noticeable like, for example, I, like, when I'm sitting at a desk, I'm actually doing it right now, I bob my leg up and down. But, um, I know that, um, that is considered normal because it's more widely accepted. Um, but is, is Tourette's similar to that? Like, do they, do people who have Tourette's, um, are their gestures just just different? Is that is that the only thing? I mean, the way I see it, like when I look at that, I think that it is, like you said, more noticeable and more out of the normal. My whole the whole thing with habit reversal therapy was kind of making them not like you can't stop them per se. You can definitely kind of like the more that you don't go into them, I think the easier it becomes to deal with it. But like it is taking something that kind of looks a little bit strange or a little bit like different, and also like can be sometimes painful can be sometimes like i've had like back issues and shoulder issues from like having to like tense my back and stuff so like not major but just like i've definitely experienced their back pain like tensing muscles and stuff so i think more so what it comes to is it is like making it less noticeable right like instead of flailing your wrist if you can just kind of fold your arms there it's a lot more acceptable and not as like glaring because you know the issue is like the human eye is drawn to things that are sometimes allowed or sometimes out of the ordinary sometimes kind of like those things so like i think it's kind of maybe to like a method of like diverting attention and to doing something like that yeah so for sure have you felt pressured from others who are more air quote normal to kind of suppress those things or to try and get rid of them or make them less noticeable i mean yes but i don't think that always has to be in a like negative way like i think that there's absolutely negative pressure to be like why are you doing this this is weird please stop and that can be hurtful i think when i was definitely younger like hey when you're in second grade you're not really prone to be able to like handle stuff like that right like as a second grader to be thrown something like tourette's where you're just like kind of have these urges to make these weird kind of involuntary movements that are definitely awkward to, you know, other second graders around you. I think I could have experienced more of that pressure there, right? People who don't know, like, why are you doing this thing? What is this? What is going on there? Right? But, like, I think now, especially as I've learned to control them, like, suppressing them isn't the right way of doing it, but, like, to have this, like, to not make them as prevalent, to not make as, like, to do this habit reversal therapy, right? To just slowly blink instead of hard blinking. Also, like, doesn't take like the physical toll like there are definitely times where like it's weirdly exhausting when you just have this like wind of having to like move or like 
tensor muscles or flail like kind of flail stuff like it also like takes a physical toll of like that's tiresome you know it's like kind of intense muscle movement so like in a weird way i have learned to suppress them but not in like a bad way not to bury them but more so to take them work through them to deal with them that way so that they aren't as noticeable and they aren't as big of a problem to me really yeah that seems like a very constructive way to um to approach it and you know like i said earlier i'm glad you were able to find that so like what was your kind of day-to-day experience while you were doing like that study did that help you like kind of unpack why you do what you do i definitely think so i think that like it was it's a funny story like we went to like i lived in virginia and we you know i'm on track on these colleges and it was run by a guy named doug woods and we went to wisconsin we went to like milwaukee and like rented an apartment for a summer and thankfully we had like a smaller like family cottage spent on our family for a while like kind of across like michigan and we were able to like take a like a ferry back and forth there but like that summer was definitely sticks out of my mind of like at the very beginning it was very different and kind of confusing and weird and nobody knew what was like like we knew what we were going on but it was still like this very foreign environment but i think to like one of the things that they'd have you do is kind of in prepped like basically you had like I'd say it was 10 or so sessions, right? And you kind of worked on each tick in each of those sessions, like a different one. And so I think ahead of time, they basically had you fill out this chart where, like, you go sit, you go do whatever, right? For me, it was watching, like, Avengers, like the Avengers cartoons. Like, you'd sit there, and then personally, you would monitor yourself. You'd say, when do these urges come up? And you just, like, write it down. Maybe make a tally mark, right? If you're going to sit and watch TV for 30 minutes, like marked on a tally like when did this come up what is it where like where is it on your person and that was really interesting too i think to kind of notice like oh i felt you know the urge to do this tick like i don't know 11 times or whatever in 30 minutes or sometimes it was more sometimes it was less and i think that definitely was one of the first experiences that i had of like being aware of my like physical person and my environment and like kind of like okay like to kind of to take that breath to kind of to look inward to like you had to be like cognizant but not cognizant so you're not focusing on it because there are definitely cases where if you focus on it if you think about it a lot stuff comes up more but like to definitely be distracted but also focusing on yourself it was like this weird balance and so i think that was like a good kind of an interesting instance of like like we had like a chart to fill out like a piece of paper with like different questionnaires of like you know like you're saying like in that 30 minute time span like what did you do how did it feel what kind of urges were there like and i think it was just like one of the first times of like physically checking in and also kind of mentally checking in that i had experienced in like my young life up to that point do you think you know yourself better now than you did before then i would say so i think that my experience like opened it up and made me very comfortable in situations where there were like you know it was like it was a study so like to be in like a psychological study and like it made me feel very comfortable going forward with that stuff and so i think it helped me like that was the first experience of being aware and like i think doing it so young and like i'm also again very blessed to have parents who are very open and concerning and like open to have like mental health discussions to have conversations to to like to encourage going to therapy even now and going to studies back then like i think there were a lot of parents i think we knew I've, like, seen a couple people in, like, later circles who have said that, like, yeah, my parents basically ignored this, right? That I also had this in second grade, but my parents ignored it up through through high school, even. So, like, I think it really helped break any kind of mental health stigmas because I was so young that it just it is what it was. There was no, like... Like, I think even now, if... Or, like, I'd say if I hadn't had an experience and, some, and something happened, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go into this study... As a 17-year-old, I think I feel a lot more maybe anxious, maybe self-conscious about that. Maybe, like, oh, like, I'm glad that it broke stigmas about mental health and psychology that really hadn't even formed ahead of that. And I think that was kind of a big takeaway now that I experience is, like, like, habit rehearsal therapy is not something exclusive to Tourette's. It's been used in, like, other ways of psychology and therapy. And so to just be, like, so open to that so young, I think, was a really important thing for me. Definitely. And this is, this is my experience. I know it's not universal. Um, but mm-hmm. 
the more people try to suppress things that are happening to them, the worse it is going to be for them in the future. And you having that ability to um, to not have to deal with people who um, who went to um, to not have to deal with people who wanted to basically act like your problems didn't exist or that they didn't matter really helped you in the long run. I think that's what really could help a lot of people in the long run. Yeah, I completely agree. Because I think, again, in Tourette, if you suppress an urge without dealing with it, without using habit wrestle therapy, and you're just like, I feel this, not going to do it, not going to do it, it does get worse. It does build, it does, get, and then it gets to a point where maybe it could come out worse or more for like a longer period of time. Like, And so I think that it is really important not to suppress things and to to open them so you can deal with them and then kind of move forward in a healthy manner. And it is, it's difficult. I definitely, like you said, like I know a lot of people and I've experienced a lot of people who were more so having to bottle things up at a younger age because it just, they couldn't deal with it or people around them didn't want to have to deal with it or they couldn't get the proper health that they needed or the help. And so I think it's really important that not to suppress these things, to deal with them, to deal with emotions while you can in kind of the present and to like to bring them up and to heal them right because you can only have healing when like when things can get brought up you can't like suppression isn't going to heal anybody it's not going to help anything it's only really going to create problems for the future absolutely um and i'm gonna be brutally honest here just as a warning um I have wanted to go back to long-term therapy for a while now, and I haven't, um, I haven't wanted to take the step necessary to, to find a new therapist because I don't feel like the connection between me and my new therapist, whoever they are, will be the same as the one between me and my old therapist. And that fear um in combination with several other things is just making my depression and my anxiety worse um and that's that's kind of the point that i wanted to get across with the whole suppression thing yeah i completely get that i understand kind of that fear of like i haven't been in situations like to that extent but there were definitely times where i think i also like i really for the first time kind of started going to will be long-term therapy the start of like february of this year right and so i had two appointments and then quote unquote the incident however you want to talk about it happened right and mm -hmm. going to an office to talk to somebody who is not in your immediate family was no longer something that is safe to do in the current environment and right. like i knew there was telehealth it's like i am with the same therapist that my mom uses and so like there was already that connection there which i think was also important but like I knew there was telehealth there. I knew that was an option, and I kind of kept finding excuses, right? Oh, oh, online school is a lot, and it is, but, like, I could pull an hour of free time out in the week to do something like that to help my mental health, and so I did. I found excuses for, like, three months, and definitely I feel like things did get worse, and, like, I kind of... Now, I think I started back up in June, right, doing telehealth, and I'm still doing it now with the same person, and... Like, I think back to those three months from, like, March through June, and I'm like, what, why, like, not in, like, a negative way, but, like, I saw how, okay, I was definitely inhibiting myself from something that is important, and so, it's hard, though, man, like, fear and, like, doing something that you know you need to do, but it's, like, there's challenges, there's steps in the, in the way, I think your thing of, like, finding a new connection is incredibly tough, it is frightening, because, like, it can be hard going from person to person to kind of to unearth other things but i also think it's very important in that yeah and i kind of feel like a hypocrite because one of the things i say on here pretty frequently is to is for people to get help if they need it while i'm sitting here not getting the help that i need but i guess yeah. i mean part of my mission really is to be open as open as I can with what what's going on uh, with me personally, because I feel like that I need to set an example. And when I don't, 
I feel like I have let people down. I feel that I can kind of relate to that too. And I definitely think that in a sense, we are all, not in a bad way, a bit hypocritical, right? Especially people with podcast platforms and things like that who like speak to other people. Like I definitely, you know, we can definitely say things that we don't necessarily adhere to. Like I have, I'm not trying to mean this as a plug or anything, but just like I have a podcast about good news, right? And yeah. like a big central thing is like to to reason to like to look to good news. It's a great thing for mental health. It's a great thing to like it does help me. But like, do I go on to like goodnewsnetwork.com hardly as much as I go on to like Fox News, CNN, NBC to like read about all the crazy stuff happening in the world? No, like, and so I kind of relate to that regard of like, you know, preaching out to like to say to the people like you know do this. This is great. This is important for mental health. But like also to fail in that regard yeah and to be like not this novel person when it comes to good news or like mental health and you know i also think too though that like it's okay to falter like if there's one thing i've learned in quarantine and one thing i've learned is like it's okay to to you know screw up it's to air as human right and so yeah. i think it's okay to to have those kind of issues because even if maybe you are internally a hypocrite those still that doesn't take away from your message right because I think no. you know your message is true. Your audience knows your message is true. And so I don't think that, like, if you're struggling to find therapists or find somebody who can help you and you're also telling other people to still help them, that still means that, like, if they go find somebody that does help them, that still means that your message is going across. And I think that that is important. And I do, you know, it is important to find people and therapists you connect with. And it's, it's important to find health. It's important to look at good news. But if you spend an hour doom scrolling, that doesn't mean that your message is any less important than it is. It doesn't mean that it's any less true. Absolutely. All right. So uh, to kind of round things out, uh, Carter, do you have any encouraging words for, for the listeners who are tuning in this week? I mean, back to what I was just saying, read good news. It's, it's an important thing to do. Like, and again, I'm older with it too, but like, it's still important to Google. Just Google good news. There's like websites dedicated to like, random news stories that's a big thing that's helped me it has helped keep me sane as much as i've gone down doom scrolling and as much as i have you know gone down rabbit holes of like these are all these scary things happening in the world it still does keep me sane to just kind of go through i think looking at like good news and people helping people which is something that i find is not as portrayed is something that is really important i also think kind of to your message if you need mental health if you need that kind of help to find somebody do you know it's important to take even those first steps like to keep doing that to maybe find a buddy maybe find somebody else who's similar to you either maybe if they have mental health to see if they can you know find somebody to refer you like yeah i think those are two important things i think find connection right now like there's still a pandemic going on there's still isolation whether it can be online, like Ethan Hill and I are in the same Discord, and it's incredible and it's fun to like have that connection. I think find some means of connection to the people around you, to the world around you. I think is very important as well. Those are just what I can think of off the top of my head. But drink water, drink the suggested amount of water as well. That's another one. Yes, please do. Um, water is very important. Oh God, I'm gonna have to edit all the Carter drinking water sounds out of this. Uh, it's fine. Sorry. Um, anyway, Carter, uh, you kind of brought it up earlier, but is there something that you would like to plug? It is. If you want to hear me talk about good news and just kind of other things, uh, me and a group of friends who I've met in a different online community that was more so for like high school students and AP students, uh, Positivity Podcast. Like the T is a T E A, not like an I T Y. But yeah, we have an Instagram. We have a podcast i think on most places you can find us and yeah if you want to hear that if you want to hear some random teams talk about good news and then you know kind of goof and kind of tangent but also just like enjoy like i find that listening to other people having fun conversations helps me a lot too you know you can kind of insert yourself into being a part of that and i think that's just a fun thing to do but yeah that's where you can find me wonderful Thank you, listeners, for tuning in this week to True Stories of a Tryhard. You can find me on Instagram at ethan.t.hewlin. You can find me on Twitter at etphonehome. The O's are zeros and the E's are threes. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at True Stories Pod. 
et phone home is such a great twitter handle by the way thank I've you i've never mentioned that but i love it so much it took me a while to find it i actually i accidentally added an extra s on the twitter handle in order to get it like legal but hmm. <laughs> it's fine That's um because apparently true stories pod just straight up was already taken even though the account hasn't been active for like five years it's fine i feel that yeah, um there's a bit what uh, uh nothing yeah i feel that of like different accounts that like haven't been active for a while like there's another positivity podcast and they like speak in like a different language and it's just like they have the title before us though but um it's just funny that like to find old accounts but yeah yeah the best way to get the word out about podcasts is via word of mouth and social media so please 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 share this with your friends share it on your social media and if you post it in some way and tag me you will get featured on the official podcast accounts and please feel free to leave a rating and review on apple podcasts i would very much appreciate it i'll be back for poor stories next week so until then this is ethan hewlin and card Vorak signing off have a great week. Bye.